Sup. Recording in progress. Sup. Uh, so this is going to be like the last bit for for now anyway. Uh, somewhat more of a application driven. Uh, for some machine learning and also some uh, genomics, so like file manipulations, things like that. Just gonna make this a little bit bigger. So second part of the thing, I'm mostly it's gonna be applications. And things I like to say is like, what? why are we using machine learning? What, what are some things you can use with machine learning? And this is not an exhaustive list. But uh, you can predict mental health outcomes. You can identify gene gene networks, uh, especially with neural networks and stuff like that. Uh, build predictive models for the complex diseases and the single cell stuff where you can cluster. You can do identify identify cells, and you can do some transfer learning. Although we we haven't even touched that, and just like why it's possible these days is you know same same reason why people are thinking larger data sets so it's larger data sets which means you have more power which means you can actually run some decent models uh so the first thing especially for when we're doing this in genomics is being able to manipulate files and cleaning the data is a big part so the first bits here are just like uh learning about manipulating a lot of this files we use in machine learning for genomics. So like GTF files and, and Plank and stuff like that. Uh, the GTF parse, it's not a replacement for Biomart. It's faster and it's a little bit easier to use. And there is a Biomart for Python. Uh, and it, it works exactly the same way as it does for R. But if you're looking more into it, it's, it's very easy and to install this especially since you're in like a notebook and you can probably do this on your if, if you have it on your computer and not in google app is you can use the jupyter magic so uh, jupyter notebooks have all kinds of magic things where you can connect with the shell or you can run specific uh commands and this one is a pip command and that's how we install stuff so you can install GTF parse just by running this. And I've, I've already installed it because I had to make it. So it's not gonna really install it, it already there. And then we're just gonna run it, import, read GTF. And again, when I was saying, because it's a Jupyter notebook, if you put the shebang or the ex exclamation mark, which is kind of like a semen, it tells Jupyter that you wanna run a command this is in some type of like virtual environment. So it's probably running on Linux. So, and it has all the basic developmental tools. So if you just put in, you can use curl. I like to use wget or wget uh, and the file location, it will install it into your current directory so that we can use the GTF parse on some actual, the, the newest release. Uh, from GenCode. And then and we can, you, know, you literally just put the file and it, it parses it out. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, you, and you can be pretty much easy for manipulation. So this is the poly A, it's a very small file. Once this is downloaded, You'll, you'll see it takes like no time to load. Most of the time, though, we're using these bigger scaffolds where it has all the chromosomes and stuff. That takes a little bit more time. So this is when I normally suggest using uh, Kush, loading it in Kush with the function tools we talked about last time. Uh, I'm just going to show you how it kind of works, where we we put this read GTF into a function. And I'm using this time space. Here's, here's the poly. Not too bad. That took almost no time at all. Uh, but this one's going to take some time. So you do what we do is like TikTok. So you process time, do the process, 
and then how long does it take to do that process? I'm just gonna take a minute. The first time you do it, that's when it's doing the, the calculation. Second time, it won't take as long. And while that's running, I can just go over here. Like this, this is a Havana. You can do any kind of GTF file. And I think it also works with uh, GFF. Uh, and it'll have the chromosome source. This is a Havana. You can do a sample. The feature type, the starts, strand, uh, a gene ID. And these are all different depending on what is actually what the Gene, uh, GTF parse. So if you were to like be on the command and do like a head or a list to just explore it, you'd see something similar. Uh, except normally the stuff that's here, gene, gene ID, transcript ID, stuff like that, that's normally in one column. And if you've had to parse this on a BAM file with a bash script, you'll understand that it's not very fun. So uh, this probably took 67 seconds, which you could say is not that long, but to me it feels like a lifetime. Uh, so if you have to do that multiple times, it's already in cache. It takes less than 0 0.000 seconds. This is much faster. I bet the only thing you're really processing is this, this head, uh, the examining the head. So much faster, so much easier. Is it, and it's especially useful if you are troubleshooting a script. And you don't want to have to spend a minute every time you change one thing. So now that we have a more intense or what you would really use as a GTF file, we can look at the features. So you have genes, transcripts, exons, and then these other things that I never use. Uh, and so if we just extract the genes, this is more familiar. You'll have the gene ID that's actually a gene ID, gene names. Uh, this is a bunch of other information that you probably don't really need. All the tags and exon stuff. Uh, we, we didn't, if you switch this to say exon, then it will have all the exon information too. So exon IDs, the exon number, uh, transcripts, because that's what you understand. And then redundancy with the gene ID. And then just like a full list of what, what chromosomes you want. And I'm just going to do genes here because normally this is all you want. You don't want everything. You just want a small annotation. And this is normally good. Uh, so not a replacement for a biomark, but if you're just needing it for position information, and if you want to like map over gene names, this is pretty useful or need this, very useful uh, and faster than trying to do the biomark. Uh, so that's GTF parsing. We can also load in plant files and you can do more than that. Uh, you can do bed files with the bed tools and it works the same way, except you can do it in Python. Uh, you can do a uh, pi liftover. So if you need to convert something, uh, SNPs or even the coordinates. And Biomark, that's the secret stuff. And then what we're going to be using is this pandas plank, where it will load in plank files. So I'm just going to down install this What when you run that and then download these files and then see how it works. So we're gonna import it and then we're getting this chromosome and then you can look to see with the plank one bin, it has all the information you need to know, uh, how much space it's taking up, the shape here, the overall shape, samples and SNPs. And then you can go in which I find it interesting, where you can see part uh, the part of the information, the samples, uh, SNPs. If you just hit this button, and I think this is, has more to do with the fact that we're using a Jupyter notebook. Uh, normally, this would just be printed, but it, it's nice that it doesn't take up that much time, much space. Uh, norm, and then if you kind of want to look, this is a tuple, so you can 
select a sample and a variant and get that specific value value or you can get the variant what is the a what is the a0 the counted what is the reference a1 of the alternative a1 and you can do that with another variant uh, normally what we end up using is just the read plank because you get all bin fam and uh, bed files and then you can see how long it takes this is one of those things that if you're doing our data then and not just this one chromosome you will want to cut uh, cache this because it takes a while and you don't want to have to do it multiple times and then you can see each individual one that uh, has the trait here gender they normally when these normally only have one gender when they're doing it uh, women and then you can see the, the bed files uh, here because we're going to make uh, a data set that we can use for uh, machine learning we want to have a unique uh, identifier so i've just made this variant in place of the snip in our data the snip is normally a unique enough that you don't need to do too much more uh, but the variant here is better if you have to do some processing. So now we have a data frame uh, where it has zeros, it has the values for each person and each individual. And we can see the size is what we would expect from the bed file. Yeah. Now for, because these are categorical and we would want to change this to one hot encoding where you have one variable and it's binary. So the way to do that is just to use git dummies uh, and you pop that in here. And because normally there's some NAs, you wanna set NA to true so that it will store NA values too. So you're not losing any information. Uh, that's very key. You don't wanna lose any information when you're uh, doing uh, machine learning. Uh, and so, do that so instead of having one variant we now have one variant and then the snip and this is just to clean it up uh if i split this here you can see it in more detail So it had this trailing number here because this is a, not a, it's, it's a float and it normally does input as a float instead of an integer. We really just want the integer and the in it, the integer values. So uh, that's why I cleaned it up. The just drop off that, it's just cleaner. Uh, and then you can see now you have ones and zeros. And so it's either present or not for each one and the size is, is more. You have significantly more features. Uh, I, I don't recommend uh, using something that only has 14 samples. That's not enough to do machine learning. This is just to show you how you can do one hot encoding. Uh, what I've done is I just put that in a function uh, that is cushed because I normally do cush. And we are exporting the phenotype information from the fam since that has our traits and the uh, the one hot. And what I did is I just used Plank to make some simulated data. And I put that in my GitHub so that I could download it to, to open access. So, because obviously we can't use our, our actual data. And then because of the way it's done, uh, right here is enough to get the information, the data we need. Oh, and again, for our actual classification of data. The first thing we'll do is we'll make an X, which is gonna be our features, and then Y, which is the prediction. And the Y is the traits. And this is, this is nice because that's 2000 people. So you're gonna get a really nice prediction regardless. Uh, and then you, the first step, you wanna split it 
so that you have training and test data so you can actually evaluate your model. And we're going to use test size so that we're making sure we have a good size training. So 75% of these are going to be training, 70% of the training, 30% is going to be for the uh, test. And then for random forest, I've just included all the stuff we want to look at that we used last time. And this time, the difference is we're including the SNPs, and we're going to predict a, uh, a phenotype. Yeah, we're going to predict a phenotype from the SNPs, which is normally quite easy if the phenotype is robust. And with the test, this was one fast because it's not that many features. And two, 93% uh, accuracy, that's fantastic. And you can just visualize it like we did last week. And you can see the majority of them, very few are being predicted incorrectly. And then with feature, a random forest, we can extract the features. It's not as like, like with the penguin where you had 32%, normally with genetics and features, if you get like 10.10%, 10, 10%, like, uh, point one, that is a very predictive feature. Uh, and SNPs is normally much smaller because there's so many uh, in here, 2000. So you're, you're going to get a lot of spread out, but it's still quite, quite good. Uh, and then for the next bit here is like using regression uh, for elastic net. And so in when, when I do this, it's normally to predict gene expression. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to use our magic to make a fake gene expression. There's no noise, so it's going to be fantastic. And then we're going to use the SNPs that we had in the simulation to see if we can use those SNPs to impute a gene expression. So the kind of a correlation thing. And for that, we'll use elastic net. So unlike PIP, our magic, you need to load this module, which communicates between R and Python. So uh, it's already in this, but if you get an error, just install it and you're, you're good to go. So same kind of thing where we're using the load and then we're gonna load this bit. And then our magic uses two of these uh, price signs. I, I, and you run it here where we're, the I, that means we're importing something and the O means we're exporting. Uh, so import the X, which was our features and exporting the gene expression thing. Uh, and here you're just, you know, you're, you're selecting a handful of those SNPs, 20, uh, and uh, making those have a correlation with gene expression, some, some, some type of correlation. And so you do the same thing make your test and training and then for this we're going to use elastic net uh, since we want a regression you could do random force regression uh, but elastic net is a good one the default for elastic net is one and, and and another reason we're using elastic net is because this is a commonly used uh, algorithm for predicting expression from SNPs and it's used in the TWAS too so that might be familiar for more familiar. The, the alpha here by default is one. And so we're doing the same thing where we're fitting our training data. And then we're going to use R square to see how well it does. A negative is really bad. It might as well be zero. So there is zero correlation with an alpha of one from those SNPs to gene expression. If we just drop this, to 0.5, and that's the default in the TWAS, by the way. If that increases it to at least a 0.3% correlation, 0.03, that shit is terrible. Uh, and then if we half that, it increases again to 25%, uh, which to me suggests that this alpha needs to be set quite close to zero uh, to get a good correlation. And what I, I learned from uh, Shijong was that for elastic net, you need to hyper tune the alpha variable because depending on that variable, depends on how well it will work. Uh, Psychic learn 
uh, in R, he does this in R. So in R, he has a function that has a uh, array, uh, a list of of alphas, uh, and then he tests that to, with a developmental set to see which alpha is the best. In Psychic Learn and Python, they actually already have uh, a method for this, uh, which is so much easier to code. All you have to do is use the cross validation version of this. So it's using cross validation. It's making uh, uh, its own developmental set and cross validation to test an array of alphas. Uh, and then it will output the best alpha and use that as your final model. So you do not have to both hyper tune the alpha, it does that in the algorithm. So it hyper tunes the alpha and then uses the best alpha for your model. And it's important to know what alpha you use. So I would always recommend kind of saving it just for like reproducibility uh, or just remembering you hyper tune the alpha if you're writing it up. Um, and so when we do that, it will take time. And I want you to, to notice first, it will take time, but two, you get 0.999% R square correlation when you hyper tune that alpha. And it decided the alpha should be half of a percentage, but like half of a half of a half of a percentage point. So it might as well be zero uh, to get the best. And you'll see at what, what the first thing is you see this kind of warning here, and it's data conversion warning. It's it it says that it, it the it was expecting a array of some different size here and for example ravel and it, it says that if you don't want to get this uh, you can use ravel but i just use flatten so this is the exact same script the only difference is that it was expecting to get a series but this has a shape like a data frame so if you flatten it uh let me show you so why train shape and it was actually expecting a series data. So if you flatten it, it now does not have that shape and you won't get the, you will not get the uh, error. It's gonna take the same amount of time, but we should get the exact same thing because I use the C, the random state and bam, no error this time and we get the results, exact same results. Uh, so if you kind of want to plot this to sh see how perfect the predictions are, you can set this as a data frame. Uh, again, this is data frame is expecting a flatten. So if you, again, you're getting that exact same data should be a one dimensional and it's technically two because it's got a, ve a vector of shape one. So just flatten it and then works perfect and no problems but these these numbers are so close that you're gonna expect to see like almost a perfect line and who is who's surprised that our simulated data with no noise has is has a perfect correlation uh, so uh, because we can't use a real snips and you can't see like like real stuff, we, we never get something this nice. I, there's like one or two genes that are above 90% for predicting using SNPs, cis SNPs. Uh, uh, so this this is where I'm going to, to stop, but it, you kind of get the idea. And it helps you think about how the TWAS is actually working and the limitations of the TWAS because they do not alpha tune uh, their elastic net. So if you're wondering why sometimes the mixed models are better it's because it's not going through a cross validation to tune the alpha it's using a standard alpha instead of finding the best alpha for the model so what i did for this breakout session is we have the exact same thing that we didn't get to last time about supervised learning so it'll go over pretty much what we did using the digit set and you can uh split it the data into training fit a classifier, print the accuracy, and then you can uh, print uh, the Confucius matrix. If you use random forest, 
you can even make a data frame where you can look at feature importance. Uh, uh, but not every, not the Gaussian models, not of every uh, classifier has feature importance. And I didn't, we do not have time to talk about how to make that because that's about classes uh, in Python. And so that's a, a whole nother, probably two or three day lecture. <laughs> so we, why don't we just do uh, the breakout sections or uh, we can do this as a group. <laughs>